Welcome to a special series where we interview a host of notable people from the Genius 100 Summit in Los Cabos, Mexico on the moment that changed everything. Here, you'll learn their secrets to success, gain invaluable insights into what shaped their careers, and key takeaways on what it takes to be a leader in their field. This is absolutely what we need. This is absolutely the future. We have to get on this. Talk to people who think so beautifully about big, complex challenges. G100 Lost Cables, a special series on the moment that changed everything. your first job? First paid job? My first paid job was working as a busboy um, at a uh, restaurant in Snowmass, uh, Colorado. I had uh, gone there to, uh, to ski with my family in uh, the winter of 72-73. Uh, of, uh, we had vacation there and I was in between my freshman and sophomore year of college and, uh, and I stayed on. Uh, actually, I first started, my very first job there was working as a maintenance man, uh, cleaning out uh, the, uh, the, the spa and toilets and taking uh, icicles off the roofs of the Tamarack Lodge at uh, Snowmass, Colorado, um, not far from, from Aspen. In those days, uh, these were separate uh, mountains. They're all connected now, uh, Snowmass, Aspen Highlands, uh, and Aspen. But that was my first paid job. Uh, I was uh, 17 years old, and as I say, in between my uh, freshman and uh, sophomore years of college at Amherst College. Amherst, okay. Where were you born? Born in New York City. Born uh, at uh, the Klingenstein uh, Pavilion in Mount Sinai Hospital, October 8, 1954. You're kidding. Okay, so there, your family, what were your parents like? Well, my parents are, are remarkable. Um, both my parents were Holocaust survivors, so okay. that already um, puts them in a special category, certainly for me and my brother. Uh, Dad passed in uh, 2019, was a remarkable man in many dimensions. We could talk about him. Mom is still alive at uh, 92 years young and remembers everything that happened to her, literally from the age of three, her idyllic life up to uh, 1941 when um, the Nazis uh, invaded the part of uh, southeastern Poland, now western Ukraine, that she and dad came from. And then she was orphaned. She lost her entire family of over 100 individuals, survived as an orphan um, for almost two years, um, hiding as a Ukrainian peasant, working in farms uh, in the Ukraine until liberated by uh, the Russians in 1944, which is really paradoxical considering that today in that same part of the world there's a terrible war going on and the Russians are the aggressors and the Ukrainians who then were collaborators with the Nazis. And my mother talks about this in great detail in, in her writings and in the documentary we made about her, how the world has changed. But uh, so both my parents came to this country after surviving the Holocaust, uh, mom in 1947, dad in 1949. Dad uh, had learned a trade. Uh, he was a, a mechanic. And through a series of uh, coincidences and accidents of fate, um, was introduced to a line of equipment, which he acquired the rights to and optimized. And he became a very successful um, individual selling and financing equipment into the laundry and dry cleaning industry with laundromats and dry cleaning plants throughout North America and distribution of, of capital equipment, um, heavy duty uh, machinery. And then he, he, he built uh, manufacturing facilities and sold all that off to a public company which was our first uh, family liquidity event. So I grew up in a environment of uh, intellectual activity. Mom became a teacher of Slavic languages and literature. Dad is a successful businessman. And somehow or other, in the middle of all of that, I ended up being interested in science and medicine and went to medical school. My brother went to law school. And here we are. <laughs> so <laughs> where did your parents meet? Um, that's another interesting story, uh, one that we're in the process of making a documentary about called uh, After the Final No. They met in a displaced persons camp um, outside of uh, Munich, Germany. Uh, there's a whole story here after the Holocaust of those who survived 
um, had been displaced from the countries of origin, in the case of my parents, Poland, Ukraine, and uh, camps were set up under the auspices of the Allies. And um, uh, uh, mom uh, was in, uh, in Fernwald, um, DP camp, and dad in um, Landsberg. And uh, my father survived with a older sister um, and actually two brothers. He lost a sister and brother and parents and cousins. Um, and the mom was uh, and five years younger than dad. And she visited um, the apartment where my father um, was living with uh, his older sister. And they weren't actually introduced to meet one another, but they met that one time um, in Munich, um, Dad had just come out of the DP camp. He was a bit older. Mom was still in the camp that uh, that that uh, after had after she'd been in an orphanage, and then they met many years later after they had both emigrated to the United States. And you know, from in those days, if you were part of different communities, whether it was from Poland or from Germany or you know wherever your your origins were, people knew one another and connected with one another. And um, mom and dad were introduced. 1950, 51, and uh, married in 53, and I was born in 54. Whoa. <laughs> and your brother? Um, Neil is uh, three and a half years younger than me. He was born in uh, 58 um, uh, on Long Island. Um, uh, I was born in Manhattan, and we were living in the Bronx, and then um, uh, mom was pregnant with Neil, and dad, dad's business was starting to succeed. Uh, the 50s were an, an, an era of, uh, you know, great economic uh, growth, especially in, in uh, the United States and opportunity. And uh, we moved uh, to Long Island to a middle class community, West Hempstead. And uh, my brother was born in um, February of 58. And uh, we lived in West Hempstead until my bar mitzvah uh, in 1967 when we moved to the south shore of Long Island uh, to a, I would say, upper middle, upper class community, the five towns, which many people have heard of. And we lived in Lawrence on the south shore of Long Island. So I got to assume that your dad building a business when you were young and because of the work ethic, obviously Holocaust survivors, did you spend more time with your dad or your mom? Really, uh, with both of them, they were both very busy. And uh, the attitude then was let the children figure out what directions they want to go in, but provide a foundation for education. It was seen, and it's always been true before our, our family and, and since then, that education is the door to opportunity. Um, and as my father used to say, education is only wasted on the uneducated. And, uh, you know, the idea of um, exceeding and, and ex excelling, I should say, um, educationally, uh, academically, was never imposed upon us. You know, you must get A's or you must be top of your class or if you don't do well, then, you know, you, you're not going to be able to achieve anything in life. There, there was none of that kind of pressure. It was just a given that learning mattered. And my mother, who was 16 when she came to this country, um, was able to go to high school. Um, I, and as I've heard from cousins on my, my, my mother's side, she came here not speaking a word of English and very quickly learned English, was quite astonishing, became, uh, rose to the top of her class in Far Rockaway High School, ended up going to college, going to graduate school, was offered to go uh, to get a PhD. She got a master's in, in languages and later in education. But dad uh, was older and, and had to work. So really had both sides of the equation, the practical, business oriented, you know, one step after another, build your success brick by brick, as well as the more academic and, you know, take the time to really be educated, see the breadth and depth of, of possibilities of careers and, you know, become a self learner. And I think both of those is what I've carried with me all my life. So they had to your question, really an equal influence. We took family vacations. Dad was a very hardworking um, individual building his business. He traveled a lot, but when he was home, he was with us. And um, mom took on a, a teaching position um, around in, in my mid-teens and was a very dedicated teacher of Slavic languages and, li languages and literature. 
but it was never a sense that our parents weren't there for us. But we were pretty self-motivated, both my brother and I, and didn't need a lot of uh, you know, hand-holding. When did you decide you wanted to be a doctor? Well, the story that's told, and, and I have memories of this, when I was in third grade, um, I had the mumps, and uh, it was a significant case of the mumps. And uh, at one point, apparently, I, had a, I was running a terrible fever, it's a virus, so there's no antibiotics that can treat it. it. has to run its course. And I fell off the bed, and I had uh, quite a, a pain in, in my abdomen, and it turned out that I had an inflamed appendix which ruptured. So I ended up having to be rushed uh, to surgery in the local hospital, um, had uh, what I now know as a physician, basically had sepsis, was put on strong antibiotics, was in the hospital for a few weeks, missed a month, month and a half of school, and I came out with this experience of uh, these physicians and nurses and the care and the environment and hearing the story of how close to not making it uh, happened. And at that point I said, I want to be a doctor when I grow up. And of course I was already interested in science and things that were um, quantitative. I was good in math. So both my academic inclinations as well as this personal experience at an early age um, sort of prompted me to be interested in science and medicine. I subsequently particularly excelled in academics. Um, I ended up skipping two years of school. Um, so I started college when I was 16. And Are you serious? Yeah. Two years? Yeah, yeah. So, well, so I did. So you were pretty young when you went to university. Yeah, I started. Like at, way younger than everybody, which uh, is a little. A year younger, I also because of the birthday. So I, I instead of doing two years of, uh, of uh, pre-K, did one year of pre-K in kindergarten. So that would have put me um, a, uh, uh, a year ahead and then skipped from uh, third to fifth grade. So after this whole incidence, playing catch up academically because I'd been out and maybe that, you know, it's hard to sort of look back on it with you know, full insight, prompted me to be even more focused on academics and- uh, Tougher to meet girls. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, in retrospect, um, skipping grades it has elements which are to be um, uh, helpful, but there are also elements psycho, emotionally, developmentally. At some point, you catch up, but I never felt that. I mean, this was the '60s, and uh, <laughs> there was a, there was a lot of very uh, easygoing uh, behavior, shall we say, and. Uh, and, and the, the community that I grew up in, um, in, in West Hempstead, um, lots of, uh, most of my playmates were from the, the, the local area. We lived in a court, so all the kids would come there to play. And we were all pretty athletic. But, uh, yeah, I, I would say as you get into, into a junior and, and, and senior high school, there can be sort of a dislocation temporarily. But, uh, but that passes, you know, pretty quickly once you get into university and, you know, you're, you're sort of on your own path. What sports did you do? Played a lot of tennis. Serious? Ten yeah, tennis and skiing. Yeah, I love tennis. Was never a great tennis player. Doubles, not singles. Um, However, doubles, you need a forehand, a backhand, a serve, and a volley. Yes, you do. Right? Yeah, exactly. In singles, you don't need all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. big serve and, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and a net game. Um, you know, enjoyed tennis and uh, we... We lived near a, a country club and would go to the courts there and, and did some some teaching for, uh, you know, for the tennis pro there for, you know, when I was in my when I was in high school. So and, you're making serious money compared to your friends. Uh, it was more volunteer uh, <laughs> okay. and, and getting free court time. I, I wasn't making uh, but I had a newspaper route when I was in West Hempstead. Uh, but. I, I'm not going to pretend that, uh, you, you know, I grew up with all kinds of jobs, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a young teenager and learned the, uh, the, the value of hard work that way. The, the hard work for me and my brother was focusing on academics, um, given the family background, uh, really taking pride in and participating in our Jewish heritage, um, but not overly so. There are members of my family Orthodox, and that was never something that was part of our upbringing. But uh, it was just a pretty balanced, normal, Long Island, middle class uh, experience, um, which continued into, uh, into college days. As I said, I was at Amherst College uh, for, uh, uh, from 71 
71, 72. Oh, and then an interesting took place. Well, I grew up in a family where many languages were spoken. Of course, uh, both my parents spoke uh, English, but when they didn't want the kids to know what was going on, um, they spoke uh, Polish or Yiddish. And uh, <laughs> Yiddish, we, at least I got a pretty good handle on, so they would be speaking Yiddish, especially with, uh, with aunts or uncles, and I knew what they were talking about. And then when I had to choose a foreign language in high school, it was sort of a natural to choose German, where there's a lot of connection. Right. And also, even then, the idea of, well, if you're interested in becoming a doctor, German was always considered to be the language of science and, and medicine, even in, you know post-World War II. But traditionally, in Europe, German was the language of science. And so uh, I studied German. And, and because of the Yiddish background or just being around languages, became uh, very good at it. And while I was a senior in high school in Lawrence, was reading um, either Der Stern or Das Bild or one of the magazines, and there was an advertisement looking for American um, students who could speak German to work at the 1972 Olympic Games. And, um, and I applied uh, with a recommendation from my German teacher, and lo and behold, I, I was accepted to be a Dolmetscher Platzanweiser, a translator, sort of uh, a seat watcher, and I worked in the boxing hall of the Munich Olympics uh, in the same area that Howard Cosell was located, and I got to meet and know Howard Cosell a bit. And of course, the most memorable, you might say, and tragic part of the Munich Olympics was, the, uh, was, was Black September was the murder of the Israeli athletes. And I was in Munich as a child of two Holocaust survivors when this event happened. How did that affect you? Well, at the time, it was so unexpected that you're not really processing it fully. And they, they shut down the whole Olympic stadium. And up to that point, the games had been idyllic. The stadium was extraordinary. Um, the whole German uh, people were reintroducing themselves in many ways to the world. And, um, you know, the games were, were conducted and suddenly this terrible uh, event took place. And of course, you know, some of the knee jerk reaction is, you know, Jews being killed, you know, on in, in Germany and, you know, uh, under, you know, German um, auspices or umbrella. My personal experience was quite the opposite in terms of the reaction of the Jewish family that I was living with while I was you know, working at the Olympics, which is that they were just heartbroken by what had happened, that they really saw uh, this as a, a reintroduction of them to, uh, to the world community. And uh, Germany had rebuilt itself, and, and Germany was a, a good friend of, uh, of Israel at, at that time and, and has been um, ever since in, in so many ways. So. Um, as much as I understood what had happened uh, in Germany and in the 30s and the 40s, World War II, the Holocaust, um, I had the experience of how quickly things can change in the world and there can be a reconciliation or at least a coming to grips of historical missteps and, and tragedies of the past and reinvention and then suddenly the past or at least circumstances in the world collude and suddenly you have this terrible uh, event uh, on German soil. So that was, uh, and I had taken time off from school. As I said, I started at Amherst as a freshman in um, September of 71, and then took off um, the, uh, the, the summer of 72 to go to Germany. I, uh, my father had gotten me a job working in an office to perfect some of my German that summer, worked at the Olympics um, in, in September and October, and then came back to the United States. Most of the first semester of what would have been my sophomore year was over. So we went out to Colorado because we'd been skiing on the East Coast. You asked me about sports. So skiing was also a big part of uh, my life from an early age. And uh, went to, to work, went to ski at Snowmass, you know, a beautiful planned resort outside of Aspen. And then as long as I had missed the first semester and I, I, skiing in Colorado was, was the first time I'd ever skied in the Rocky Mountains and powder and and in wide open slopes. I said, this is pretty cool. Um, maybe I'll just stay out here and, you know, spend the winter here and I'll go back to school, um, you know, for you know, uh, in, in September. So I, I did that. I stayed out there and skied until March or April. And then I had another interesting experience. Um, I had a car out there and I took a, a ride out to California. Um, this is now April, May going into the into the summer of uh, of uh, 70, uh, 70, 74, and um, 
and saw Stanford University and was knocked out by what I saw on the campus of Stanford and uh, came back to Amherst, actually went to UMass um, Amherst the summer of 74, did my sophomore year at Amherst, went to Harvard and completed my pre-med um, uh, studies the summer of uh, 74 at Harvard. And I had applied to, uh, to transfer to Stanford and I got in and I transferred to Stanford for my junior and senior year. And that was just a remarkable experience, 74, 75, 76, being in San Francisco in the early to mid 70s and everything were outside of San Francisco and Palo Alto. And I could go on and on about what Stanford was like then in the intersection of the technology, Silicon Valley um, successes and the, 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 the microelectronics and computer technology and the beginning of the whole biotechnology revolution. And that's what I was studying at Stanford was biology and biochemistry with Nobel Prize winners doing research at Stanford University Hospital. But the idea of going to medical school and being a nice Jewish boy, and my brother was already, already oriented towards law, I, it, 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 and, and becoming a, a PhD in a, in a sort of narrow slice of, of bioscience, I considered it, but medical school was on the agenda. I applied to Harvard, and I got into Harvard and proceeded in 1976 to go to Harvard Med. What's your day like, an average day for you? Today? Today. <laughs> I, I, I sit with wonderful people like you, Laurie, and do <laughs> Well, no, really. What's your day like? <laughs> yeah. Well, well. So, uh, to condense uh, uh, two decades of study of medicine, clinical research, basic um, research in in in, in uh, bioscience, um, some academic activities, and then. Some of the research that uh, I was doing became of interest to a, a, a life science company in California that was working in the area of uh, diabetes. Um, I, I, what I was interested in was acquiring physiological signals in real time using transducers. And this company was developing an insulin pump, a company called Minimed. And they wanted to have a continuous glucose monitor. Anyway. The work that I was doing related to the team that was developing continuous um, non-invasive glucose monitoring, if you have the ability to measure glucose and you have the ability to deliver insulin, in effect, you have a positive feedback loop, you have an artificial pancreas, and that company became the largest insulin pump company in the world, went public, got, got acquired, and all of this happened over about a 10-year period. So by the mid-90s, I'd had a liquidity event. And our family had had a liquidity event, so I had a fair amount of capital, did not have to do clinical or academic medicine. And to answer your question of what do I do every day, um, have taken the capital and insights to startup companies and applying technologies and working with teams to identify unmet medical needs and then to, to try to fund early stage companies that meet those unmet needs, either through medical devices or diagnostics or therapeutics, mostly focusing on medical devices. So that's a significant part of the time. And over the last almost 20 years, I've been doing a lot of that in Israel, where we formed a number of companies, taking two of them public, um, uh, one in metabolic disease, um, diabetes and obesity, another in structural heart, um, uh, minimally invasive valve replacement, and the most recent company that we took public in cancer therapeutics with a novel um, internal radiation delivery system. And then, in, at least uh, in the United States, if you are fortunate to make money, there are a lot of incentives to form a foundation. And I'd grown up, as I said, with a balance of business in, in our family and um, literature and arts on mom's side. And we, from an early age, gone to museums and, and dance and theater, etc. So started a foundation. About 20 years ago, um, prosaically named the Dr. David M. Milch Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> How'd and, you come um, up with the name? Yeah, I, I, did you, know, you use was, an ad I, agency for that? Like, I, it, it, <laughs> it was a, it, developing that took you know you know months and months of planning and, and 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 no small amount of expense, but actually a very small amount of expense. But uh, yeah, there was actually a time in which we thought maybe you know. To, to, try to get away from something too hubristic. But that, that's how we, uh, we, we named it. And that's what it is. And, um, and we focus on two areas, which occupies a fair amount of my time um, and the team's time, uh, youth mentoring 
because in many ways I feel that the parenting that I received and, and, and teachers and role models early on, Al Mann from Minimed and other brilliant entrepreneurs, um, the, some of the Nobel Prize winners that I was fortunate enough to work with at Stanford and at Harvard, um, and, and, and I learned early on, you can have someone from a very challenging background that rises above it. You can have you know, children from privileged backgrounds and they fall between the cracks. And so much of it has to do with the right individuals at the right time seeing the potential in a young man or woman and, and, and telling them, regardless of your circumstances, you can achieve. Or given your privileges, if you don't rethink how you're conducting your life, things are not going to work out for you, both ends of the spectrum. So we do youth mentoring in New York, um, uh, in Harlem, through a remarkable organization, Brotherhood Sister Soul, and um, in the South Bronx and uh, Lower Manhattan through Sophie Gerson Healthy Youth. And, um, and then the, the other area is the arts. So we have something called ARS, A-R-S, in Latin, art, veritas. Harvard, uh, the motto is veritas, truth. And um, we call that arts for social impact. And we have funded a whole variety of initiatives, theater, music, um, uh, painting, performance, um, in the United States mostly, and in Israel. And currently have an exhibition that we've put together combining canvases and music and video, which is going to be having its debut at Brandeis University in September, then moving to the Florida Holocaust Museum, because some of the themes have to do with um, understanding the Holocaust through arts. Um, and we've contributed to a, a definitive two-volume work on arts and the Holocaust, which explains these two um, academicians, uh, Gail Humphreys and uh, Dr. Gail Humphreys and Dr. Karen Berman, on who, 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 whose whole life has been spent on using arts to understand difficult circumstances throughout history, um, dislocations, ethnic cleansing, socioeconomic disparities. And this happens to be about uh, the Holocaust. And they learned about our work and three of the 36 chapters we're contributing to. We're putting a whole educational program to go with the exhibition. And our hope is to take this plus the educational component to, um, to universities and museums throughout North America. And we're already getting interest um, abroad as well. So that's, that, that's what we do. Okay. Um, the name of our show is The Moment That Changed Everything. What was yours? Well, uh, I, I talked about uh, third grade being very ill and surviving that and the messaging that if not for the physicians and the emergency surgery, I wouldn't be around. Um, that was a, 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 a game changer, a life changer for me. Um, being in Munich, Germany in 1972, you know, and being in, in the country which had perpetrated so much suffering on my family and seeing how this country had turned itself around and then suddenly tragedy striking um, once again and seeing the vagaries of life and how quickly things that you thought were smoothly moving ahead can turn around and vice versa, how things that are so challenging and, and, and tragic can suddenly turn around with the right interventions and, and the right insight. Um, and, and probably showing up on Stanford University campus and realizing you know, the, the breadth and depth of opportunity and the doors wide open for someone with a curious mind and the willingness to apply it diligently and be open-minded to, to new change, to changes and to new experiences, which only continued at Stanford. So as a youngster, um, my personal experience as a young adult um, on foreign soil and my academic experiences where no doors were closed to me and um, every opportunity was afforded. And I've built upon that ever since. David, thank you. This has been the moment that changed everything. Um, being shot and recorded at Genius 100 Visions in Las Cabos, Mexico. David, will you join us again? Absolutely. Hey, Such a pleasure. So much. And I want to thank you, Lawrence. I want to thank the, uh, uh, the organizers of G100, Genius 100, Rami Kleinman and uh, Ambassador Ido Acheroni and Helen Hazlitz and Hilary Viner and, and, and Monette um, Walsi. And just what they're doing here, what you're doing with us is so necessary 
today with the challenges that really are mounting on, on so many levels. And as I've said in our conversation, um, I, with a snap of a finger, things that seem to be going well can change for, for the worse. And things that seem to be going nowhere but downhill can change for the better. And it all comes down to individuals making the conscious decision to do right by themselves and by others. And that's what G100 is about. That's what the communications and the connections that are being made here are about. And that's what the world needs in so many ways. And we're all participating in that. Thank you. Honestly, thank you. This thank has been awesome. <laughs> thank you, Lori. <laughs> to learn more about how you can support G100 initiatives, visit Genius100Vision.com.